So once again, thank you so much for attending tonight's Kasigi Lifecraft webinar. Our topic tonight is No More Sad Kasigis, How to Cope with Sensitivity, Anxiety, and Depression. And the sad is kind of a play on words, taking the first letters, it's making an acronym out of sensitivity, anxiety, and depression. And Kasigis will get into, let me introduce myself. I'm Sharon Barnes. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Colorado. I have a master's degree in social work from San Diego State University. I am also known as the Scrap Lady. I help you create beauty and benefit from life scraps. And I do that through creative healing presentations, play shops, retreats, and webinars and through creative healing and creative transformation counseling and psychotherapy. I am, in a sense, a wilderness guide. I guide Kasigis through the wilderness of inner territory to destinations of delight. And my website is therapistforsensitiveandgifted.com. And I almost clicked the wrong button and closed out the PowerPoint presentation. So glad I caught that. So why do Kasigis seem to be so susceptible to being sad from sensitivity, anxiety, and depression? Well, this little cartoon clip here shows um, an example of one aspect of that. Kasigis can even talk here. Kasigis are typically visual, spatial, kinesthetic processors and learners. So we may be the kind of folks that um, have our desks piled full, have um, our file cabinets not even well organized, and may have stacks of paper on the floor, etc. And that chaos, external chaos, can be a reflection of inner chaos or not, but that can complicate our lives. A huge aspect of why sensitivity, anxiety, and depression are such issues are the characteristics that go into making up kasigis, the creativity, curiosity, and complexity are the first part of this. The A is for acute awareness. The S is for super sensitivity. Then comes intensity, often introversion, and intelligence, which all goes into giftedness. Sensitive people may have several of these characteristics. Gifted people often have many of them and sometimes all of them. That adds great complexity to a person's life. Creativity alone, having idea after idea after idea, and yet being bound by the three dimensions of time and space and, and physicality is a setup for great frustration. Curiosity, we're curious about all kinds of things, or curiosity is the curiosity killed the cat. Well, curiosity might kill a kasigi sometimes. It can certainly get in the way of focusing and being efficient and accomplishing and getting one task done. Complexity is being aware of the complexity of life, the complexity of a situation at work or in our home life or in, in the planet that um, makes it difficult to sometimes land on one side of an issue or another or we can relate to everybody's side in an argument or in a discussion. It can also be make it more difficult for us to make decisions when we can see the great complexity. Acute awareness, we're aware of things that other people aren't. We notice little details uh, in, in our environment or we notice things about what's going on. We hear what's being said between the lines, what's not really being said in ways that other people may not. Supersensitivity can be a 
Um, it can be a physiological thing, a central nervous system sensitivity. It can be an emotional sensitivity. It can be a spiritual sensitivity. There's lots of ways that this sensitivity can show itself. In the gifted field, a term that's often used kind of equivalent to this super sensitivity is over excitability. And, and there's several different kinds of over excitabilities. I prefer to refer to it as super sensitivity because Yes, Kasigis are more sensitive than most other people, but that doesn't mean it's an over-sensitivity or an over-excitability. Only if you take the other 80% of the population as the norm, does it become an over-sensitivity. Intensity relates to the sensitivity, the awareness, and to the reaction time, the reaction, um, the amount of reaction in our central nervous system, in our emotions, etc. Introversion is another way in which Kasigis are often out of sync with the culture. The um, culture in the United States is predominantly an extroverted culture. The culture in actually the majorities, uh, majority of countries and cultures around the world are extroverted uh, at this point in time. And about 75% of, of, quote, neurotypical people are extroverted, whereas about 75% of Kasigis are introverted. High intelligence can go with this. The, and, and high intelligence can exist with or without high sensitivity. Giftedness is uh, the combination of high intelligence and high sensitivity. According to Elaine Aaron, the psychologist who coined the term highly sensitive person and did the research behind that, described highly sensitive persons as about 20% of the population and also says that about 20% of all species are highly sensitive. Giftedness, when you combine the high intelligence with the high sensitivity, is about 3 to 5% of the population, depending on specifically how you define the giftedness. And, and so in my view, the gifted are a subset of the super sensitive. Not all highly sensitive people are gifted, but all gifted people are highly sensitive. So I'm, there's an overlap between these two groups, and so most of my comments are going to apply to both groups, but not quite all. And so I hope uh, that um, what I have to say is helpful and relevant, and um, would love feedback to you about what's most relevant. We've talked before in a previous webinar about how Kasigis are different by design. And Kasigis often struggle with, who am I? We live in a culture that is predominantly a plow, like the plow horses here. That it's repetitive tasks and, and just getting things done in a rote kind of way. But Kasigis are made like racehorses, like these here. They need, their, their minds need to race, and sometimes their bodies need that as well. And so there's a, often a great disconnect between how Kasigis are made and wired and the culture that we live in. And, and it's, that makes it even more important for Kasigis to find environments in which they can thrive. If you put a racehorse in front of a plow, you're not going to have a very well plowed field. If you put a plow horse in a race, you're not going to have a very well run race. And they may not even run at all. So, so it's key to know who we are and, and to organize our lives according to how we're made and how we're wired. And, and, so that we're not always working against ourselves in order to function in life. So that's kind of a basic thing that we start with. 
We've also talked about in a previous webinar about the four aspects of um, transformation. Starts with number one, creative coping, number two, creative healing, number four, or can't even count tonight, can I? One is creative coping, two healing, three transformation, and four is making a creative con contribution. Tonight, we are going to focus on the creative coping. I said in the um, promo material that I was going to give information about what is the most powerful yet hidden tool that parents and teachers have to be able to help Kasigi kids and teens deal with their discouragement. And I want to get into that before we get into the actual coping tool. The most powerful, and, the, and, and it's often a hidden or a tool we don't pay attention much to, is that kids and teens learn by seeing and by doing, but in, with kids and their parents or kids and their teachers or kids and grandparents, it's often monkey see, monkey do. It's the most natural way that we all learn. It also takes one to know one. And as parents, teachers, grandparents, um, therapists, we cannot lead someone where we're not willing or able to go. So the most powerful influence on the child is the unlived life of the parent or teacher. And that comes from Carl Jung. So the implication and the application of this is to use these tools that I'm going to talk about tonight for yourself first and then use them with your children or students or grandchildren. So I'm going to give most of my examples for adults because I want you to really use them with yourselves first before passing them on um, to someone else. The very first, so I've got the top 10, and I, I believe in the emails and social media posts that I put out, I talked about top five. But when it came down to um, cutting out half of them, I um, couldn't do that. Didn't know which ones to cut out and which ones to keep. So we are going to touch briefly and lightly on these. And I'll be interested. I would like to hear input and feedback from you folks about which ones you found most helpful. Ian. A different webinar, I gave a different kind of breathing tool. When stress goes up, when anxiety goes up, and when depression increases, what we typically do is that we breathe from the top half of our chest up. And a full deep breath moves the belly. But when you're stressed, you don't move your belly, you just breathe from your upper chest. And I would like each one of you to tune in right now, and, and if you would be willing to type in the chat window and tell me where are you breathing from right now. Just pay attention to your breath. Anybody breathing from your belly, or are you breathing from your chest? Nobody's breathing, apparently. Belly is one person. What about some of the rest of you folks? Where are you breathing from? Nobody's answering. Okay. Oh, belly now. <laughs> yes, now that we're paying attention, we do. And so this belly breathing to help us shift in a stressful situation is to put our hands on our stomach below the waist and to breathe from our belly. And to slow down our breathing, focus on our breathing. And to focus especially on taking longer to exhale. And continue to do this. If you get lightheaded or dizzy when you do that, when you're doing this, make sure you breathe in that an equal amount of air as you breathe out. 
and fill and empty your lungs as completely as possible with each breath. At the bottom of the screen, you, you'll see, you can see a, um, a web address. If you go to my website, therapistforsensitiveandgifted.com forward slash relaxation breathing exercises with a dash in between, there's instructions there for a couple of other breathing exercises. The one that's a counted breathing exercise is particularly helpful, but it's more time consuming, so I didn't want to take the webinar time. But that one in particular, all of these can do it to some extent. That one in particular will help um, flip the switch in the body between the fight or flight response and the relaxation response. So when, as a highly sensitive person, you get overstimulated and you can just feel the intensity rising and your anxiety rising that any one of these can really help and it's all about which one's most accessible to you right now so that is really the first thing to do when you feel anxious when you feel sadness um, depression um, or sensitivity getting out of hand, breathe is number one. And there's some, some ways to go about doing it. Number two is whatever's happening, don't fight it. And I've talked about this to some extent in some of my other webinars as well. Most of us are socialized to fight what we're feeling. We're told when we're very young, many times infants, don't be mad, don't be sad, don't cry, don't this, don't that. But all of that is counterproductive. That's like putting together a pressure cooker and putting it on the, you know, with water or, or food or, you know, something in it to cook, putting it on the stove and not giving it a steam valve to release some of the pressure in a tiny, small, regulated way. Feeling what we feel, we can heal. That comes from John Gray, the, the author of um, The Mars and Venus Sky. Well, before he wrote The Mars and Venus book, he wrote a book called What You Feel, You Can Heal. And, and that is so true. When we're fighting it, we set up um, an energetic resistance to it that strengthens it and disempowers us. And so as we allow ourselves to feel it, we can experience it and then we can let it flow through us and, and flow beyond us. Identifying what are you feeling? Are you feeling sad? Are you feeling angry? Are you feeling scared? Are you feeling overwhelmed? Are you feeling what? What, and often it's many things, or more than one thing. It can be helpful to use, um, and particularly if you're a visual spatial learner, um, it can be helpful to use emoticon. And you might want to make a game out of, or, or there's a lot of emoticon kind of apps out there. And you can make a fun thing out of this. What am I feeling right now? And I would like to give each of you about 30 seconds to tune in to yourself right now and to identify what emotions are you feeling in this very moment. And I'm going to put on some music here for the rest, the about the last 15 seconds of our our time. Okay, that was probably overstimulating music. Sorry about that. We'll get um, more relaxing music for the next time we do that. Um, well, didn't intend it for, for to start now. Um, 
was that um, how many did you each get how, in, in identifying um, your emotions? How many different emotions did you identify? Anybody want to share on the chat window? Not really, okay. It also can be very helpful to recognize what's happening in your life that's getting you down. Our emotions are very much like waves in the ocean. Um, this photograph here, this child has a pocket, her pockets turned inside out, which which um, speaks to a lack of, makes us think about empty pockets and, you know, not enough money. That's certainly one example. Lots of different things can can um, raise um, our anxiety, can bring on whatever emotions. But emotions, just like the waves in the ocean are connected to the weather, the events in our lives are kind of like the emotional weather. And, and it can be very helpful to identify that. Number five is do what you can do. Rake the leaves. Balance the checkbook. Um, do the dishes, do the grocery shopping, um, clean the bathroom, clean the kitchen, put gas in your car, um, or plug your car in if that's the kind of, you know, how you, quote, fill your car up. Um, do what you can do. Identify what can I do about whatever it is that's bothering you. And the next thing is let go of what can't be done. And if any of you have something close to you that's not breakable, I would like you to pick it up and hold it in your hand and then hold it out over the floor. And again, this is something not breakable. If you've got something breakable in your hand, put it down and find something breakable in a pen or a pencil or a nail file or, a, you know, I don't know, whatever, piece of paper. Doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's not breakable. Hold it over the floor and let go of it. That's how simple letting go of things can be. And it can be helpful to write down the things that are going on in our lives on a piece of paper and take that piece of paper and let go of it, particularly for those of us who are visual and kinesthetic processors these things that seem silly and childish can really be helpful in a very practical way to literally let go of what cannot, what you cannot do something about. Number seven is to don't wait until you feel good to treat yourself well. When we're feeling bad, we tend to do things that perpetuate the state of being that we're in. And doing something to break that state and and um, to do what's called a pattern interrupt can be very important. So if, if you know that going for a walk is going to make you feel better, it can be really difficult to get up and do that. But so if that's inaccessible, then back yourself down to a lesser thing. What else might help you feel better that's not quite so inaccessible as going for a walk? Might stretching your shoulders, stretching your arms, stretching your toes out in front of you. Might that be accessible? Or might drinking a glass of water be accessible? What little tiny small thing can you do to treat yourself well? And I would like to take a few seconds here, and I would like each one of you to write down at least five things you know of, small little things. I don't know, light a candle, drink a glass of water, um, look out a window, you know what it is for you, I'd like you to please make a list of five things that help you feel better.
right. That was 20 or 25 seconds, something like that. Um, next time you um, want to feel better, look up that list. And you might want to keep that where you can where you can easily find it or put it in a place. Number eight is express your emotions creatively. And that is to make something that represents what it is that you're feeling. You'll notice this is my second quote from Carl Jung. He says, as often the hands will solve a mystery that the intellect has struggled with in vain. And, and that's one of the principles behind why um, this is in my top 10 um, tips and tools to help yourself as a Kasigi feel better. We're going to come back to this one a little more. Next one next is to turn your emotion into motion. And next week, moving can really help us feel better. And there's lots of reasons why, and there's lots of ways to get ourselves to increase our motion. Next week, our webinar is going to be about this one. We're going to focus on this one entirely. And we've got a chiropractor to come and talk to us. And this chiropractor um, knows about living and working with Kasigis. Um, and and uh, the reason why is um, um, we've got nepotism going on here. I will make a confession. Um, the, the chiropractor that's going to be speaking to us is Matthew Barnes. He's my son. And um, so I'm really going to, when he was 17, he thought he knew everything there was to know. And, of course, the more schooling that he got and the more life experience he got, the more he discovered that he didn't, but I'm going to turn around and recognize um, what he does know, and I've asked him to come and talk to us about the connection between physical exercise and phys physical emotion and, let's see if I can say that, physical motion and our emotional well-being. So next week, we're going to focus on that completely. Balance your brain. That's really, really crucial. The um, brain on the left is a brain on fire. And I don't know if you have ever felt like your brain or your body was on fire from the inside out. But if you have felt that way, you know how important it is to put the fire out so that your brain can function normally and be a happy brain again. And I think I may have mentioned in, a, in another um, what previous webinar how the Chinese have a different perspective on the, the body functioning than, than Western allopathic medicine does. Western allopathic medicine's focus is on the body working and functioning. In Chinese medicine, the emphasis is on body systems being happy. And there's a huge difference. And I think for Kasigis, in order for us to feel good and, and um, have a good life, we need to have a body and brain and soul and spirit that are happy. And, and so balancing our brain is a significant part of this. I didn't get pictures in here of, of this, but um, a Kasigi brain and a Kasigi body is like the racehorse we talked about a little while ago. It's also a like a high-performance car in contrast to an ordinary car. The first high-performance car that I had um, when I when I bought it as a used car with 100,000 miles on it, and the um, man that was um, th that I was buying it through and and working with in in buying this car, um, in fact drove uh, a very similar car himself. And what he told me was, if you give this car the maintenance that it needs, you 
will love it. If you don't, you will hate it. And that is a perfect scenario, or a perfect fit for Kasigis as well. If we take care of our brains and our bodies the way they need it to be done, then we will love being a Kasigi. If we don't take care of our brains and our bodies, and I'm also going to say our souls and our spirits, like they need to be, um, if we do it, we will love being a Kasigi. If we don't, we will absolutely hate being a Kasigi. And I think that's one of the big mismatches for most of us is, number one, we don't know how to. Number two, we don't have permission to. Number three, we're so out of balance already that, that things are a great deal out of control. And so it's how do we get things how do we put the fire out that's already destroying us from the inside out? And and so I, that is a huge focus for me. And some of that has to do with physiological things and how to live with a highly sensitive physiology. Some has to do with the highly sensitive spirituality that we have. And some has to do with the great intelligence that some of us have. And and. So those are all aspects of this. It starts with balancing the body, because if that's not in balance, then the rest of it can't be. So you may get frustrated with me, but I really um, want to, to emphasize how important, I, I don't think I can overemphasize how important that this is. Number 11. Oh, yes. I was. I, I did say top 10, didn't I? Well, here we go. I can't count. And um, eliminating important things is, is a huge difficulty for me. So you get some bonus ones. This one is no more ugly duckling. You're a swan. And recognize it. Stop trying to be an ugly duckling. Stop trying to fit in the mold of all the ugly ducklings around you. And it, if you haven't read it in a while, look up the, um, the story of the ugly duckling and read it again. It's a wonderful story about recognizing who you really are as a Kasigi. And accept that you're a swan and begin to discover how to live the life of a swan. Because you are one. Twelve is give thanks for what's going well in your life. And it's very, very easy for a Kasigi, for a highly sensitive person, for a gifted person, to feel like there's nothing going right, nothing going well in my life right now. But... Pay attention. Do you have a roof over your head? Do you have electricity? You likely have um, an electronic device of some sort, a computer, a phone, uh, something in which you're accessing this webinar. Do you have food to eat? You may not have the house you'd like. Do you have transportation? Um, give thanks for those things. The more difficult that it is to find things to give thanks for, the more important it is and the more powerful it is. And you will notice that it, I, I did not say be thankful. I'm not talking about how you feel. I am talking about what you do. I have had a practice for many years of writing down at least five things, five to seven things a day that I'm thankful for. And that is really powerful. I have learned to balance that. Um, and I start out, actually, I start out by writing seven gripes 
or as many as up to seven gripes. And then I write the gratitudes. And then I move to giggles, and then I move to goals. So I call that my daily 4G. That is gripes, gratitudes, giggles, find some humor when you can and where you can, and then goals. Okay, so what do you want for this day? So there's an extra bonus there. There's nothing on the screen about that. Um, and 13 is get help. When you cannot use and access the coping tool that you know um, that you know you ha that you have been able to use in the past. That's one time to get help. Um, I have uh, an article on my website that's called um, "When Can Counseling Help a Kasigi?" So if you go to my website, therapistforgiftedandsensitive.com forward slash counseling. It says here sensitive gifted, it, but if you if you click on the counseling drop down list in under there, there should be an article. When can counseling help? Um, if you've got questions and and concerns about that, but there's a, a resource for you. So that's our Baker's dozen top tips and tools to help sensitive gifted people balance their sensitivity, anxiety, and depression so that there's no more sad kasigi. I'd like to take a few minutes and let's go back and let's use this three-step process that I promised you, three-step process to help to identify and outsmart sadness, sensitivity, anxiety, and depression before it takes over. So this three-step process is to create, to contemplate, and then to crystallize. So let's do it. And I didn't give you um, a homework about this ahead of time because I really would like you to just find a writing instrument, any writing instrument, something within your reach or easily accessible to you. I don't care if it's a crayon. I don't care if it's a highlighter. Pen, pencil does not matter. And and I don't want you to, to um, obsess about it to get the right one. And also something to write on. You can pull a, an envelope or a piece of paper out of the trash or the recycling or a piece of paper out of your printer whatever's closest and easiest and quickest. Then I would like you to take your writing instrument and put it in your non-dominant hand. If you're ambidextrous, put it in the hand you use least often for writing or drawing or whatever you do. So now I would like you to take, um, we're gonna take about 30 seconds again, and I would like you Actually, preferably close your eyes, or before you close your eyes, put the writing instrument on the paper, and then close your eyes. Again, this is using your non-dominant hand, and draw something to demonstrate or illustrate your inner state right now. So go ahead and move the writing instrument on the paper. So that was create. All 
our next step, step number two, is to stop, look, and listen. And to look is, what do you see? And hold your paper up, and you can turn it every which way, and discover what shapes are there, what color, if there is a color, what textures come through what has been drawn there. What else do you see? And give it a voice. If it could talk, what would it say to you? And that is activate your imagination. Have an imaginary conversation with what you have created. And focus this conversation on the topic at hand, on the emotions that you identified earlier this evening, or the emotion or emotions that you were illustrating and demonstrating with your drawing and follow this conversation wherever it leads you. And does this illuminate anything about your Kasigi sadness? What are you aware of now that you weren't aware of before? Record what you were aware of now. You can write something about it or you can draw something more. Or when we're done in a few minutes, you can make an audio or a video recording or use some other medium to record what you have received and what you've learned and gained through doing this three-step process to help you with this. I hope that um, you have been helped by what we've talked about tonight. I would like to open up our time for um, questions or comments through the chat window, if and I'm going to see if, in fact, I can reset this so that we can um, possibly even, here we go, All Q and attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. So if you're on a phone, you can press star six. If you're on um, a computer, there should be a microphone icon at the top of your screen that you that that should show the microphone with a line um, diagonal line through it. If you would like to say something to ask a question or make a comment, um, you can click on that microphone. Or you can also use the chat window if you'd rather communicate that way. But I'd love to have any comments or questions that this has brought up for you. Sensitivity. Thank you, um, Niraj. Sensitivity, is it something similar to anxiety and depression? Hence, i.e. pathological, hence need to be reduced. Um, I actually don't think that any of these are necessarily pathological. They're people who are not um, particularly sensitive are likely to consider highly sensitive people and gifted people to be, quote, oversensitive. There is a discrepancy between the level of sensitivity or the amount of sensitivity that people have. Who's to say what's the, n the norm? Um, I think we that, that society and culture needs highly sensitive people. 
highly sensitive people are like the canary that they used to take into mines. That the canary would keel over, faint or even die um, when the um, level of carbon monoxide would get too high. And that would alert the miners to that there was a dangerous situation and they needed to get out of there. I believe that highly sensitive people are like that canary on this planet. We are here and serve a great purpose or can serve a great purpose. We, in order to serve that great purpose, it takes learning how to live as a highly sensitive person, how to live in tune with our high sensitivity, our intensity, our creativity, our intelligence, all of these characteristics. We have to learn about ourselves and these aspects of ourselves along with other aspects. And, how we, and we have to le learn to live in tune with that, in sync with that. And yes, that may be out of sync with society in general. Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison, many, many inventor people that if they had not done their work, we all would be um, lesser for it. And, and it would have, Im we would impact all of our lives negatively. So it makes it really important for us to learn how to live with anxiety. Depression and anxiety are, quote, symptoms. My take on symptoms is that symptoms are messengers, that there's something in our lives out of balance and out of whack. It may be that we have wounds from early life. It may be something else. Anxiety and overstimulation from our central nervous system, our sensitive central nervous system being overstimulated can look and feel very similar because they both can involve the fight or flight response. And so it takes some inner reflection and awareness as to is this anxiety, is something scaring me? Am I afraid about something, or am I just overstimulated? And and it can be really important to, to learn how to sort that out. Emotionally, when the intensity of our reaction is out of proportion to what's happening in our lives right now, that often means that we are not only reacting to something that's going on right now, but we're also reacting to something emotionally that is in our past or in some other portion of our lives. If work is really, really stressful, that may use up all our coping capacity, and it may also um, ramp up the intensity. We may be in a fight-or-flight response. Um, much of the time, we may be in one all of the time. So we get home from work, and we have very little coping capacity left. Um, and and our attention and our focus is often taken up in trying to deal with what's going on inside of us. So communicating with someone else or, quote, being there for, for someone else is difficult or maybe even impossible at times like that. And so that makes it really important to communicate with those close to us in proximity or in intimacy or whatever. What is going on in our lives? What's the weather that's pushing our emotions and our bodies and that's stressing us and makes it really important to do what we can to de-escalate our bodies and our minds. So the breathing exercises are a really good place to start. 
um, and to return to, to bring our body back down. And, and then go back through that baker's dozen of tips and tools. So which are the ones that are relevant right now? Which are the ones can be most helpful to me right now? Because not every one of those is pertinent to every situation. It's a, it's a sorting process internally as to which one to use. So when it's pathological, that is a determination of when does it start to interfere with what you want and need in your life for sensitivity, for anxiety, and for depression. How about, so did that answer your question? Did that speak to what you were um, wanting to address in that question? And are there other questions that anybody has? Again, if you want to use your microphone, feel free to unmute your mic. You're, um, you're able to, to unmute it either through the phone or through the computer. And uh, there's the chat window also available. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Oh, here, here we go. Um, how to deal with sensitivity in one sentence? Wow. <laughs> Off the top of my head, which is really what you're asking for, is number one, accept being sensitive. It's okay to be sensitive. It's how you were wired. It's how you were made. So learn about it and learn to live with your sensitivity instead of fighting it, and then maximize it. So that's one long, complicated step. Take advantage of it. Use it. Learn how your sensitivity can can help you and help others. And um, we're back to Rudolph with his red nose, that his red nose was different than everyone else's. and got him excluded and ostracized and eventually banished to the land of misfit toys but it was that very thing that helped him save christmas day for everyone now you and i may not have that dramatic a thing to do but each one of us has something that our wound our quote big defect can be turned around and sensitivity can be that big defect that can be turned around and its flip side can be your great gift to give the world. That's my one sentence. I want to thank you each for participating tonight. When I close out the presentation, there's going to be a survey, or there should be anyway. If it works right, there will be a survey. I would love for you to please take another couple minutes and uh, give, give me your feedback. Thank you very much for participating in our LifeCraft Kasigi webinar, No More Sad Kasigis, How to Cope with Sensitivity, Anxiety, and Depression. Thanks a lot and good night.